welcome back everybody to another episode of the nonprofit show. We're very, very excited because today is the kickoff of Nonprofit Power Week with YPTC. Okay, we have the amazing Justine Townsend, a manager with YPTC on, and we're gonna talk about reducing audit stress and some strategies. Um, I find this really interesting and we're gonna get into it with you because this is a big topic. You know, another big topic we have on the show are our amazing sponsors, and they include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Fundraisers Friday, our new episodes on Fridays, and your part-time controller. We have amazing co-hosts. Again, I'm Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy, and um, I'm flying solo today with Justine. Okay, Justine, Tell us about your audit background. So, so yes, in addition to being a witch, I was also an auditor. <laughs> so um, I started out in, um, in accounting. I started out as a baby auditor um, and I did audit for a little over three years. I left all, when I left, I had about 35 clients I was managing um, across the year, all nonprofits um, and a lot of arts organizations, um, a lot of other types of organizations. But, you know, I, I love my arts babies the most. You, with your arts background, that you can then roll that into the accounting world. And so I give you a lot of credit for this because it's got to make you so much more... Um, I don't know, like able to communicate, compassionate, and you can reduce a lot of stress for your, your clients. And so today, I think this is exciting because, man, I can't imagine that too many organizations are like, whoopee, yay, audit season, right? Oh, that's never, that's never what we hear. It's always, it's always a freak out time. Um, it doesn't have to be. <laughs> Right, and that's what right. we're going to talk about today is that it doesn't have to be a freak out time. If you're mm -hmm. ready for it and you've stayed ready for it, which is what we'll talk about, then then really it is not a big deal. It is just a part of your year. It's just a part well, of the cycle. Well, I love that you framed it that way. So let's start off with what auditors do and then conversely, what don't they do? Like give us the those two levels. Absolutely. So auditors, their whole goal, their whole job is just issue an opinion, right? Like you're paying them all this money and really all you're paying for is that opinion. So okay. the goal is for them to have an opinion, an unmodified opinion, meaning they, they totally agree that your financials are fairly represented in all material respects. That means that you don't have any material misstatements in your audit and that they have reviewed all of your financials for any material misstatements. They could miss small stuff. They're not saying they caught everything. It's not to the penny. It is materially correct. And what is material for the organization is really determined by the auditors based on a risk calculation. So that's something else they do is they assess risk. So when they assess risk, they determine whether or not they need to do a lot of testing or a little testing, um, whether or not they need to look at a lot of substantive stuff or can we just do analytics on this area? So they determine kind of what are their audit processes for each area. Um, they are not responsible for finding fraud. If they find fraud, then they have to tell you about it. Um, if they find a risk of fraud along the process, then they need to tell you about those significant risks or material risks or really any risk of fraud. They need to communicate that. But they're not required to identify fraud. So if you've had an audit, it does not guarantee you against fraud. Um, they're required to meet with management as part of that risk assessment. They're required to do... Um, 
confirming all of the balances. So they might reach out to third parties and confirm it that way. Um, they need to assess whether or not you're going to keep your doors open for the next year. So that can be, if you get a going concern in your opinion, that could mean they don't, they don't think you're going to make it another year. So they are required to for the future a little bit, but that's it. Um, what they don't do Conversely, on the opposite side of that, after that long list of what they do do, what they don't do besides they don't specifically look for fraud is they cannot close your books for you. They cannot reconcile your accounts for you. They cannot tell you what the balances should be. They cannot um, prep for the audit for you. They cannot prepare your financial statements for you. They cannot write your note disclosures for you. Though. If you ask for a template, they'll give it to you. And also, if you don't know what your disclosure should be, they'll give you a disclosure checklist. Mm -hmm. And you can just read that whole checklist. Um, they cannot create your statement of functional expenses. Sometimes the auditors will take your trial balance and pull it into their system. And that will create some financial statements. But your trial balance is really the basis of that. And that's how we kind of say, oh, there's no independence issue there. But that statement of functional expenses is not something they can pull straight from your trial balance. So they can never prepare that. You will always be responsible for that. You, they also cannot send out those confirmations, obviously, because they need to come from you because you have to authorize the bank to confirm those amounts um, or your donors. Um, they cannot tell you what's restricted and what's not restricted, what's conditional and what's not conditional. They can't tell you that. So you need to make those um, identifications as you go. They cannot tell you how to implement new accounting standards or new requirements. That is your job to implement those. Any changes that they think you should make, it is your job to implement those changes. They might make recommendations, but it's your job to determine how to implement those recommendations. Um, they can't tell you what your chart of accounts should look like. Uh, they cannot tell you what your accounting policies and procedures should be, what your document retention policy should be, what your conflict of interest policy should be. They can't give you any of that. All they can do is determine whether or not it exists and then recommend that you have one if you don't. Okay, so you just have kind of blown my mind, sister, because <laughs> I've been thinking that throughout my time as a board member where the, the audit is presented, right? And, you, you know, you know that the audit presentation meeting is going to come up and everybody comes and it's a little tense. Um, I thought it was a lot more um, operationally involved like that they would give advice on what, um, you know, they thought that the approach and the management was. So I'm, I'm finding this really interesting because I would imagine most uh, board members and those, and they go on across America, <laughs> they think that that's part of what the audit is, right? So let me, with that right, in mind. Then, oh, I was going to say, and that's, they can make recommendations that you need to make changes, but in your operations, they're just not going to tell you exactly what needs to change and exactly how to do it. That's really the organization's job. So then let's bounce forward and ask the question, what is the audit for and who's it going to, who's going to see it? Sure. So the goal of the audit is to, to get that opinion saying, yes, these financials are correct. We're going to send it out then to our funders. We're going to send it it out to the bank who's given us a loan. We're going to send it out to donors who, uh, especially a kind of high level individual donors who are in organizations, put it on their website. You're going to upload this into your GuideStar profile or Candid, right? GuideStar currently Candid profile so that you have complete transparency and you want to spread it from the rooftops. Look, we are correct. We are, our financials are materially correct. We've had this audit. If you're going to pay for the audit, tell everybody. Right, right. It's such an interesting so thing. The, right, when right. we, when we, get, um, you know, when we think about these audits and you're saying, okay, we need to be shouting this from the rooftops. Um, do you think that we need to help uh, those that are going to be looking at it, like you said, our our stakeholders, funders, you know, our financial institutions, our partners in that 
range. Do we need to help them understand what this is supposed to do? Or are they going to know? Oh, 1,000 percent. I mean, well, you know, your banker knows what it's for, right? Your right. grantor, when they request the audit for your grant application, they know what they're doing with it. They know how to read it. But for the board, for your audit committee, for your finance committee, and even for key members of management, you want to ensure that you've given them the opportunity to walk through that audit and understand how it is different than the monthly financials they're used to seeing, right? Because because that format of the audit is generally accepted accounting principles because we're presenting the audit in our gap format and the required format, it might not be what you're seeing on a monthly basis as a board member, right? Because those monthly financials are management's financials, and we can make modifications to make it make more sense to the board. However, being able to say, this is what we looked at all year, and this is what the actual audit results are, what are the differences? And how do I use this audit differently than I use those monthly financials? It's a yeah. very important meeting to have yeah. with the board, especially right before the auditors come to present to the board. You want to make sure that you've prepped them for that meeting and that they know what questions to ask the auditors. You know, I, I love that you said that because no, that's OK. I don't think I've ever had um, that training. You know, all the years I've been a part of going, mm -hmm. you know, for a review of this, I can't think of um, being prepped like that, which is really dreadful. I mean, like really dreadful. And I will tell you, and I would imagine many board members can echo this, that there's a lot of fear of asking questions when that presentation has been made. You get generally a stack of papers, you get somebody oh, from the the outside firm come and then you're just like okay because it's pretty overwhelming you know? oh definitely and you're afraid i i'll often see board members afraid to ask anything afraid they're going to trigger the auditor to look more or the auditor is going to take back their opinion because they've asked hey this year i noticed this thing and they don't want to they're not trying to tell on anybody so it is really important to have an internal meeting either before the audit is presented or afterwards where you can prep the board and give them that opportunity to ask those questions and to really walk through that set of financial statements so that there is a good understanding, especially the note disclosures. Those note disclosures are extremely valuable. It's really yeah. important that the board understands them and, and knows how to read them because that's where you really find out. Stages. Yeah. So then that, that's kind of like until the end of the audit, that follow up where they present. Let's you know, maybe step back and say, what are the other steps before we get to the end? Um, so we start with a planning meeting typically. I mean, if you're picking a new auditor for the first time ever, then we're going to start with a request for proposal. And you're going to send out one of those RFPs to each of the audit firms in your community that work with nonprofits. Um, you do not want an auditor that does not audit nonprofits. You are a special baby. And you need special auditors that know what you do and understand your work and understand the um, accounting standards that are specific to nonprofits, like conditional contributions, restricted contributions. Those are things that are not happening in the for-profit world. And so we definitely want auditors who understand them and don't have to go dig in and do research, right? Because you're paying for auditors by the hour. So you want them to have an expertise. That will drive down the cost of your audit. Um, so you might go through that RFP process, and then you're going to go into planning with the auditors. That planning meeting will typically include the audit partner, audit manager, and then key members of management at your organization, um, including your CFO, controller, accountants. Um, if YPT, if you if you have YPTC, then we handle that, um, and we'll coordinate everything with the auditors. Um, after that planning meeting, then that's when we determine, okay, what do we need to give you when we figure out our timeline for the actual field work. In between the planning meeting and the field work, when the auditors are either on site or virtually looking at all of your um, financials, looking at that substantive testing, checking on you, in between that planning and year end and field work, that is when we are preparing for the audit. 
Um, and so if you've not been preparing all all year long, then you're going to want to maximize that time. However, if you've stayed prepared, then you can minimize that time. After field work, which is usually either the auditors are on site or they're working remotely for a specified period of time, that's kind of an all hands on deck time. That's yeah. when the auditors are, are kind of sending questions every day. And, and no matter what department you're in, you're like, oh, the audit is so stressful because, you know, I'm walking in your office asking you randomly, hey, aren't you? <laughs> 30. We, um, how many tickets did we sell to this event? Um, can you run that report for me randomly? So you, that's more doing all those kind of like follow-up questions. And then afterwards there's the reporting. That's when they're reviewing the reports, pulling it all together and then and, uh, slapping their opinion on it and going back and forth with us on what changes need to be made and making sure everybody agrees to the note disclosures. And then we get to that final meeting where they go through the financials, they go through their opinion. And if they have any findings, that's where they would present those findings. And those findings, when they give you a finding and they tell you this is an area of risk for the organization, they'll give you a recommendation for like what you need to do. But it's right. usually not very specific. It's like... Hey, put in place some processes to prevent this from happening. So you need to know what processes you need to put in place. You need to think about what is the policy or procedure you need to prevent this from happening going forward. They're not going to tell you exactly what to do or how to implement it. I want to jump forward again and talk about the importance of a month end close, because it seems like that we're like, okay, we're trying to do our work and we're trying to get all these other things. And the it's end difficult. of the month comes fast. Yes, it does. And it's difficult to prioritize when we have, oh, there's a special event going or, oh, there's this, there's lots of reasons yeah. to not do a month and close. If you make, you can find a reason every single month. So you have to really find a reason to do it every single month because you can find a reason not to every month. We're all busy. We know. The reason to do it every month is because it's going to make that time in between the planning and the field work when you're doing that audit prep, that time you can keep that to a very tight time and it's going to keep it stress-free for you. Because when you have been doing month and close all year long, you're ready for the audit. You're staying audit ready on a monthly basis. The month end close is a detective control, right? So getting back to like, no, internal controls. A detective control is a control that, that will catch your errors or your fraud on the back end. And a month end close is your key detective control. So if you are doing a month end close every month, then you're going to find any of those issues so that the auditors don't. Um, that's going to prevent you having any findings. Um, and it's going to keep your audit moving quickly so that when they say they're there for three days of field work, that's it. You don't end up with a week. Um, and it's going to aid in your decision making all year long, right? When our information is timely, the decisions that we make are better and more informed. Um, and then also, you know, in nonprofits, we have to disclose our liquidity position on the last day of the year. We have to say, this is what our liquidity, you have a note disclosure that says, this is what our liquidity was. This is what we have available to spend down for next year. If you are looking at this every single month, then you can plan for a better liquidity number at the end of the year. You can plan your year around having that strong liquidity. So you don't have a note disclosure that you have to send out to funders that says, we don't really have enough cash to make it through the first three months of the year, because that's how you get that going concern. So really being able to manage your liquidity all year long. So you're working towards what you want those financials to look like at the end of the year. And you're really actively managing that. What you're saying to us is that as we're navigating our year, we're navigating our month ends. If we have a question or concern, maybe even the adoption of a new policy um, that we think will factor into the audit, that is the time to ask those questions and get that clarification prior to the audit. That's fascinating. And I got to say, I would have never thought of that. Oh, well, who thinks about, you know, implementing a lease standard six months before the audit? <laughs> we do. We think about that. <laughs> yeah, we do. Well, that's Not many why people that's top of mind. <laughs> yeah.
Yeah. Well, that's why we're glad you're in our corner. Yeah. Um, exactly. So basically the message that I'm gleaning from you today is that this audit prep really, we're going to reduce our stress if we are looking at this as a year round activity, not just that time when nobody could take a vacation because the auditors are going to be <laughs> right. I mean, it's, it's a different mindset, right? It's a totally different mindset. And what we want is for audit prep should be a day or two extra per year, right? Oh, wow. Because that month end close is 90% of your audit prep. So you should only need a day or two to just do the extra special work papers that we only do for the auditors. But if you stay organized all year, you're ensuring your compliance with your new standards, you're keeping that month end close going, you're keeping everything reconciled, you're communicating with your auditors throughout the year about any changes, right? And their schedule and your schedule, then you can stay audit ready and have no stress at audit time. Wow, it's a really, um, it is, I use the word mindset and you echoed that word too. It's really an interesting way to look at this. And when you mentioned it's an extra couple of days, I would think a lot of folks think this is like a two week, maybe three week gig. Yes, if you're not doing your month in close all year long, right? <laughs> we can push, we can push that work to the, the end of the year or we can do a few days every month right right and and of course doing a few days every month i think you brought this up is that it's going to protect us from issues of fraud um issues that just are operational where we're going and then also you mentioned this and, and i kind of want to end with this is that it really helps us to understand what our trend and our trajectories are so that they're not such big surprises right because I think that's one of the magics of accounting is that it helps us forecast. If Absolutely. we can think of it that as, as that tool, it can cause, it can reduce a lot of issues across the management system of our nonprofit. Oh, 1000%. Especially if when we have timely information, we can make timely good decisions, right? And we're well informed about our cash position and all of the other kind of looming financial changes that we have coming, if we're looking at it on a monthly basis. Yeah. So we stay ready. And then when the auditors come and they want to do risk assessment yeah. and they ask what our risks are, we are ready with answers to say, we don't have it because we're on top of it every month. <laughs> right. No, I agree. And I think too, internally, you know, we talk so much about this on the nonprofit show. What is it that we can do to be efficient and to run good programs and to run organizations that our donor investors have confidence in and that our funders are excited to participate in, right? And this is like, to me, one of those key strategies that we we need to really um, embrace and then, you know, report back out. Um, because if we don't, we're just, we're making life so much harder. You know, I, I really got to say for those of you who have uh, maybe been a little challenged by this episode, because we've had a few lags, um, this has really been a fun episode because, and an important episode, because we're talking about so many issues that we're going to build upon throughout this uh, nonprofit power week with your part-time controller. This week's going to be very interesting. We, we're going to be talking about technology as a financial tool, AI, buckle in, because this is a big topic. We're going to be talking about financial best practices, like what are the modern best practices for nonprofits when it comes to understanding your finance and your accounting piece. And then we're going to be talking about budgeting, which a lot of folks are like, oh, no, that's as bad as audit, but it shouldn't be. And it should really help you. And then our final day is going to be an ask and answer. Those are all the questions that have come in. Um, we've been already out there saying, hey, if you've got questions for YPTC, let us know. So we'll wrap up our week that way, um, because it's really it's such an important it's a to me, it's a foundational part of how we run our nonprofits. It's the finance and accounting side. Justine Townsend, manager, your part-time controller. If you joined us in the beginning, one of my top five guest episodes we've ever had was with Justine. You can find that on our archives. 
we have since labeled her the Wicked Witch of Accounting because she showed up <laughs> on Halloween as as a witch and it was just fabulous. And so if you have a chance to find that, it's just a remarkable episode. It's an important episode too, but just to see this like really intelligent, articulate wizard of all things accounting showing up, it, it was just one of my favorites. So I just have to call you out on that, Justine, and say thank you very much. <laughs> It's, oh, thank it's, you. It's been a lot of fun. Hey, you know, we want to make sure as we end our episode today that we thank our partners. They include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Fundraisers Friday, and your part-time controller who joined us today for Nonprofit Power Week. We end each and every episode with this mantra, and it means something different all the time to me. And today it means something um, a little bit more holistically, like staying on top of things. But our, our message is this, to stay well so you can do well. Thank you, Justine.